Let's open up our Bibles this morning. Where can I put this? To Matthew chapter 7, if you would please. Matthew 7. We are coming down the home stretch of this series now on uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And we've been, as you know, going verse by verse, or I should say passage by passage, maybe be a better way to say it. We've been going through this, this greatest sermon ever preached. And Matthew 7, we covered verses 1 to 5 last week. And we talked about the right way to judge. And then today, as you can see in the, in the title of the, of the YouTube description, or the title of the uh, sermon there, it says, Give Not. Give Not. We are going to cover just one verse today, verse number 6. So let's go ahead and read that, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus said in verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. If you would, please, let's bow our heads together, and let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, we come to you in Jesus' wonderful name. And Father, we thank you for the privilege to sing these songs, to remind us to, to slow down, take time to be holy. We thank you for the Spirit of God dwelling in our hearts, constantly reminding us, bearing witness that we are children of God, bearing witness that we are saved, that we're on our way to heaven. Lord, I ask that today you would please speak to our hearts specifically on the subjects that we're going to cover Many things that need to be said, Father, I can't say any of them properly. It won't make any difference if you don't lead and guide and have your hand upon this. Please now help all of us. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now today's sermon is going to, it's going to come to you in two parts. I would like to think that the first part is going to be more teaching the second part more of, of, a, of a sermon, more preaching to it. The first part is going to come across like a lesson because I want to make sure that you understand what Jesus meant when He gave us verse 6. I want to talk about the primary meaning and teach the verse to you. Then I'm going to switch it up and, and I'm just going to preach something very practical and use verse 6 as kind of a springboard or... Uh, a diving board where I can dive into the sermon from there. Now, as you can see, the first two words in verse number six, give not, give not. That's not something you hear a preacher say very often, right? Give not. Uh, there is one time you can read this in the Old Testament where Moses had to tell the people of God, stop giving. They, they had a building project going on, right? In the book of Exodus, they were commanded to bring various resources to build the tabernacle. And the people were so into that building project, they brought thing after thing after thing. And they brought too much. And Moses had to cut it off and say, guys, that's, that's enough. Rarely, rarely do you see such a, such a thing going on. Now, Jesus, he's not talking about our uh, resources, our money, our wealth in this verse the thing that he's dealing with is so much more valuable than that. So let's look through this verse and try to identify the holy. He says, give not that which is holy. We're going to talk about the pearls, and then we'll look at the dogs and the swine. So let's just move through this one thing at a time. Give not that which is holy. What, what are we talking about when we discuss something that is holy? To be holy means it, you're devoted to God. Anything or anyone that is devoted to God, that the proper term would be it is holy, or we might say sacred. Anytime I think about the word holiness, for whatever reason, my mind jumps back to the book of Leviticus. The theme of that book is holiness and sanctification. That word also goes right along with holiness. And you can see all through the book various sacrifices and offerings that the people of Israel were supposed to give. And anytime they gave it, that thing, that animal, it became sacred or holy. By the time you get to the end of the book of Leviticus, however, 
I find it very interesting that God waited until the very end of that book, the last chapter, He talks about a person devoting him or herself. And he goes through various genders, age brackets, old men, young kids, it, everything in between. It talks about that person being devoted to God. When I read in verse 6 about, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, I'm immediately, my mind is jolted to somebody that has devoted themselves to God. That person, in, now in God's sight, that, is, that person has made that sacred commitment and God views that person in, in a holy way. Let's move to the next thing because I believe the pearl will also link in with that which is holy. What, what, do, what did Jesus mean when He says, Neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Just quickly turn to Matthew 13. Verse 45, something that is holy or someone that is holy is devoted entirely to God. And in that same thought, Matthew 13, verse 45, Jesus gives us this parable. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. What I'd like for you to see in this is that the pearl is something very valuable. It's something very precious. A pearl is a precious stone, biblically speaking, and even in the world they consider it a, a precious stone. How much is it worth? Well, in verse 46, when he had found just one, it says he sold all that he had and bought it. This immediately takes my mind to Ephesians 5 and verse 25 where, where Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. What could be so valuable that the Lord Jesus Christ would give everything, including Himself? He left behind the Father. He left behind heaven. He left behind that that abundant glory, and He came down to this earth, humbled Himself, made Himself of no reputation, gave it all, laid it, laid down His life. Why? He loved the church. He gave Himself for it. Can I take it one step further? Friend, He did that for you. Your soul was so valuable. Your life was, was so precious to Him that He gave everything He had just so that you could be purchased by the precious blood of Christ. Now, if you come back to Matthew 7, with that groundwork being laid, I believe when Jesus talks about that which is holy, and He talks about pearls, we're talking about very valuable, precious souls that have been dedicated or committed, devoted to God. And these precious souls that have made a commitment to God. Jesus is speaking to His disciples and He says, be very careful, guys, knowing that His disciples, His followers, will eventually, after they're done hearing this sermon and, and as they continue to follow Christ, they are going to tell other people, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the Messiah is here, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Who can follow Jesus and not want to invite other people to follow Jesus. Jesus said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Knowing that His disciples would do this, I believe He's warning them. When you have the privilege of helping some other poor lost soul come to know God through Christ, you need to view that person as holy, as sacred, devoted to God, precious, valuable. Be careful not to give, not to allow that precious soul to come under the influence of the dogs and the swine. What does he mean by dogs and swine? Matthew 7, let your eyes run down the page to verse 15. Right there in the context, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets. Now notice how he brings the animal kingdom back into it. Which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening, ravening wolves. 
I believe there's three different metaphors being used here for false preachers, dogs, swine, wolves. And forgive me, but for the sake of time, I, I don't want to dig into how deep those metaphors go, but it's certainly worth investigation on your own time. I would like to give you a couple passages, however, to show that dogs and swine do play into false preachers and false religion, unclean religion. Let's take, you can hold Matthew 7, but get Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah 56, and let's begin reading at verse number 9. Isaiah 56 and verse 9 give you just a moment to find it. The beauty of YouTube is you can hit pause, right, if I go too quickly. Wouldn't that be nice if we could do that in person too? Hit pause and let, let everybody catch up and be, be on the same pace, but we're doing the best we can. Isaiah 56 and verse 9, he says, All ye beast of the field, come to devour, yea, all ye beast in the forest. Now, just to set the, the context, set the tone here, God is pronouncing judgment against the nation of Israel. And one of the reasons that the nation of Israel fell into apostasy was that her prophets were not preaching. Her prophets had, had turned to this prosperity type gospel and they would go out to the people and say, peace, peace, when there was no peace. They were promising great things when God had promised punishment and judgment for their sins. You can see this in verse 10. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb. Look at what they are. Dogs. They cannot bark. They, they don't give the right message. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. They're lazy preachers. Verse 11, yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. You see how these are the leaders. The, these people are supposed to be uh, preaching the Word of God and leading the people, and they're not. He says at the end of verse 11, They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. He's looking to, for his gain. He cries out, Give, give. You might remember that from Proverbs chapter 30. The horse leech, the daughter of the horse leech, lo loves to cry that out. Give, give. This preacher that we're talking about, this dog, he's making merchandise of God's people. Now that, that is in 2 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to be there in just a moment. In verse 12, let's just finish this passage. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. Oh, watch what they're preaching prosperity, abundance of earthly goods. Come on, let's, let's party, let's drink, let's enjoy life. Eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow we'll have it even better. God said, that's what destroyed the nation. Take your Bible. Come, you can hold Matthew 7 still, but look over in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, as I said, we're just teaching a little bit here in the beginning, and then I'm going to switch, switch modes, and we'll go into preaching mode in just a moment. 2 Peter chapter 2. Let me give you just a little bit of background for it. Look at verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. You see, they will claim, they will claim to have this apostolic succession and to be part of the biblical uh, Christendom. And because of, because of their claims, people think that these, these guys... These wolves in sheep's clothing, they'll think that they're part of the true body of Christ and speak evil of the way of truth. What are they doing? Verse 3, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words, fake words, they don't mean what they're saying, with feigned words make merchandise of you. Do you see the connection? Now, come down to the end of the chapter. After explaining 
how these false prophets work. He talks about how they affect the poor souls that come under their influence. People sometimes will get involved and, and listen to what these preachers have to say and, and think, wow, we found you know, the truth. This guy's talking about Jesus and he's talking about miracles and how God can fix all the problems of my life. And then this person, instead of going towards the true Jesus, they, they grab a hold of this, this false God that these preachers have created. And after they've tried it for a little while, their lives end up a mess because they thought they were trying the real Jesus, when in fact, the Jesus that those preachers were giving them, as, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, was another Jesus. They were preaching another gospel. Verse 22, these people end up worse than they began because they think, I tried the truth, you know, I tried Jesus, it didn't work. They, they didn't try the real biblical Jesus. So in verse 22, it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow, that's, that's the female version, right, of the swine, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Can I point out something that, that usually goes overlooked? The dog is referred to in the masculine. Did you see that? The dog is turned to his own vomit again. And then this sow it, that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You see, in both cases, you, you have the, this animal that gets cleaned up on the outside, but then goes right back to it. There's this external cleaning, but it didn't change the fact that the dog was still a dog and the pig was just a pig. Notice that the dog is masculine, the sow is referred to in the feminine. I believe what we're dealing with, with dogs and swine, are, un, are, are false preachers filled with unclean spirits, and some of them are men and some of them are women. And that's been going on for centuries, even before the time of Christ. You can go back in the Old Testament and read Ezekiel especially. You'll see how God targeted the female preachers in that time and how they were ruining the nation. So back in Matthew 7 and verse 6, I believe the warning of this verse comes clear now. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. What's the warning? These souls that convert to Christ, be very careful not to allow false preachers to influence them. Don't compromise and join arms with and, and begin this fellowship with false teachers just so that you gain high esteem in the religious world. Don't compromise the truth. If you do, he says, lest they trample them under their feet. They're going to ruin those lives and turn again and rend you. That compromise that you made in order to be friends with everyone and, and for, to be held in high esteem and high honor amongst the other religious leaders in town, that compromise will eventually come back to bite you. It will eventually ruin you. It'll mess up your testimony so bad and possibly even your own doctrine. The warning is be careful. Warn Warn those new converts, watch out for certain people. Be careful, beware of false prophets, Jesus said. Our job as disciples of Christ is to make more disciples of Christ, but that includes not only winning them to the Lord through preaching the gospel, but then discipling them, helping them to get grounded, well-grounded and established in the faith so that the, when the winds of doctrine, false doctrine, begin to blow, they don't get blown away. In the book of Jude, you read that we are supposed to earnestly contend for the faith. We're not supposed to compromise and say, well, even though this guy says something different about the Bible, everybody has their own opinion and we'll leave it at that. That's, when it comes to biblical fundamental truth, we cannot compromise. We have to stand for what's right. And although that may not be popular, it's one of the responsibilities of a disciple of Christ. When you see or hear false teaching, you're supposed to blow the whistle. I understand you should speak the truth in love. I'm not telling anyone to be ugly or rude or mean. 
But this is of the utmost importance. These souls are holy and precious to God. We cannot take that responsibility lightly. As your shepherd, the shepherd of this congregation, right? I want, if any predator comes around, when any wolf comes around dressed in sheep's clothing, don't we read in Psalm 23 that about the good shepherd that his rod and his staff, they comfort me. Every shepherd should have the staff ready, the rod of the Word of God. And when that wolf comes around trying to snatch away a sheep, we whack that wolf on the head and say, no, no, you can't come in here and get away with false teaching. Now, I've given you the direct, I believe what Jesus directly meant when He said it. I would like to use now the principle of this verse and preach to you just for a few minutes. Jesus has warned the disciples not to allow something valuable and precious to be given and wasted on dogs and swine. So I want to talk about some very valuable and precious things that you have in your life that you should not give away at any point. Take your Bible, come to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to move around just to a few scriptures today. 1 Peter chapter 3. And I have five things I'd like to talk about that you should not give. Give not, right? Give not. Now this, this is going to be, I want to call this a shotgun sermon. A shotgun sermon. Because I'm going to pull the trigger once. One sermon. And when you, when you shoot a shotgun, the buckshot just sprays out. So the buckshot, I'm going to be a little here, a little there. It's all connected to this principle of not giving away something that is very holy and precious. But I'd like to cover a lot of ground with this. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. The first thing I want to say, give not, give not away your sanctification. Be careful not to give up your sanctification. Let, let's see what I why I say that. 1 Peter 3 verse 1, Likewise, you wives, be, sub, uh, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So they, even though the men don't pay attention to the Bible, they can watch how their wives live, right? and that can win them over. Verse 2, While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Chaste is like holy. Sanctified. Verse 3, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair. We would say braiding the hair. And of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. So the, the, for the woman, her true adornment is not the makeup and the clothing and the jewelry. The true adornment is something that comes from within. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. We're talking about give not that which is holy. Give not that which is precious and rare and valuable. And among the things that are of a great price in the sight of God is your chaste conversation, your, your holy manner of living. Look at verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. I showed you the verse just a moment ago in 2 Peter chapter 2. The dog returns to his vomit. The sow returns to her wallowing in the mire. They go back to the old way of living. Now, in 2 Peter 2, you're dealing with people that never had a real relationship with Jesus Christ. They had a, a, an encounter with a false religion. You say, but what about me? I've been truly saved. I've met the, the biblical Jesus. I've committed my heart and soul to Him. Listen, if you've done that, you're no longer a dog. You're not a pig. You're a sheep. You might have been that some other creature before, but in Christ, right? Paul wrote, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You're no longer that dog or that pig you used to be. You're a sheep. You're a sheep. You need to stay as close as you can to the shepherd and let him keep you clean. As a new creature, we are commanded to put away the old man. Put off the old man and put on the new man. Paul said it like this in Romans 13. 
but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Folks, now that you're saved, you've been washed clean by the blood of Christ, the Holy Spirit so gently and patiently works with you to overcome those besetting sins, those things that constantly seem to bog down your spiritual life. Don't give in to a momentary impulse. Don't allow the lust of the flesh to overcome you. That sanctified, holy walk that you now have, the fact that you've been able to crucify the flesh and put away the old man, don't take that lightly in the sight of God. That is of a great price. Please hold First Peter because we'll be right back to it. But come a few pages back to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25. Hebrews 11 and verse 25. I'd really like for you to see this because as born-again people. I believe there is something within us that wants to do right. There is that desire to overcome sin. Now, there is still the old nature that constantly wants to do wrong. Paul said, the good that I would, I do not, but the evil that I would not, that I do. There's always that struggle within us. Don't take it lightly that you have the privilege now, the opportunity to yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, to walk in the Spirit that you don't Fulfill the lust of the flesh. Don't be overcome by a momentary impulse to go back to the old life. Hebrews 11 and verse 25, talking about Moses, it says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see, Moses could have become very temporarily minded and said, But it feels good right now. Think of the bigger picture. He knew that being part of God's people and having that clean testimony was of great value. Look at verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He knew that in the long run, it would be worth it. Too many times we give in to the pleasure of sin for that season. It feels good now, but oh, what are you, what's the price? What are you giving? What are you throwing to the dogs and pigs of that sinful nature? Can I, can I narrow this down? I, I, if there are some young people listening, and I'm sure there are, some teenagers, would you please, please give me your attention just for a moment? Some of you students, maybe, maybe you're not a teenager any longer, but you're not married yet. You're looking for Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. Please hear what I say. Don't give away your purity. Don't give away your purity. What a precious thing to offer not only to God, but to your spouse to be. Hang on to your purity. Give not that which is holy and precious, this sanctified life. Don't give it to some dog or some pig. Can I ask you, hold your place in 1 Peter. We'll come back. But flip over to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. And let me move to my second thing now. First of all, give not your sanctification to the dogs and pigs of the flesh. Number two, give not, give not the Scriptures. Give not up the Scriptures. What a holy and blessed treasure we have in the Word of God. In the book of Psalms, we read in chapter 119, Thy word is, is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. We're talking about something very precious. Look at Proverbs chapter 2 and verse number 1. Proverbs 2 verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. Now this is Solomon writing to his children. However, I believe you can easily see how we could read this as God speaking to one of his children, yes? My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures. Where do you find these treasures? In the Father's words. 
Verse 5, Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Where do we find this deeper relationship with God? We have to dig and search for these treasures that are hidden throughout the Word of God, just waiting to be revealed, but only to the soul that seeks it genuinely. The world, the flesh, the devil would like nothing more than for you to lay down, to give up your hunger for the Scriptures. The devil knows how powerful this book is. When he went to tempt the Lord Jesus in the wilderness, he tempted Him with the lust of the flesh, with the lust of the eyes, and with the pride of life. How did Jesus overcome all temptations? He did so by saying, but it is written. Jesus pulled out the sword of the Spirit, sharper than any two-edged sword, the most valuable thing that we have on this earth. And each time he overcame the devil. Have you looked in Ephesians 6 at our spiritual armor? As you read about it, we have many things that are defensive. We have a breastplate. We have a shield. All of these are defensive pieces. But our sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, it's our only offensive weapon. Therefore, if the dogs and the pigs of this world are to overcome you, what must they do? They have to knock the weapon out of your hand. Give not away your weapon. Hang on to it. Cleave unto it. Can I show you a verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. First Peter 2 and verse 2, we read this, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. There, there's the temptation to say, but Brother Mike, I haven't given up my Bible. I still have it. I still believe it. Right? It's not only the world that is attacking the Bible. You can find quite a few churches these days that attack the Bible and uh, say that there are mistakes in it and that God hasn't preserved it. And there's an attack from every angle on the Word of God. So it is a big deal for a Christian to still hold on to his Bible and say, but I believe it. That is a good statement. Thank God for that. But that's not enough. In verse 2, what I'd like to bring to your attention is Peter saying that you should desire the sincere milk of the Word. You might still have your Bible in your hand, but you may have lost your hunger. That sincere desire for the Word of God. You might believe the Bible, but it may sit on your desk and just collect dust. When's the last time you opened it up and devoured it? And said, God, I want not only the milk, I'd like to grow and even take on the meat, but God, I just can't get enough of Your Word. Don't give away your hunger for the Scriptures. Don't give up the Scriptures to what the dogs and the pigs of this world have to say. Let me show you another thing in 1 Peter chapter 2 while we're there. Give not up your sanctification. Don't give up the Scriptures and give not, number three, your sacred fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've purposely termed it sacred fellowship. We can have a fellowship with the brethren, and I believe that in a sense is sacred as well, but there is something very special about walking with, with the Lord Jesus Christ, that personal relationship with Him. Don't take that for granted. In the sight of God and in the sight of man, that should be of an, of, of an immense value that we cannot put a price tag on. 1 Peter chapter 2, look with me at verse number 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious, precious. Verse 5, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. I've just, I wanted to read through that so that you can see the emphasis. The believer that has tasted and seen that the Lord is good, 
the believer that has dug into his Bible and read about the Lord Jesus and everything that goes with him, he knows that there's something so special, so sanctified, so high and holy. There's, there's just something about that man. We ought to be able to say that he's rare, that he's precious, that we don't treat him like anything else in our lives. You know, the church in Ephesus, when you read in, in the book of Revelation, they were a good church. But Jesus had one thing against them. He said, you guys, you've left your first love. You know, it's very, very common when we meet Christ for the first time and we fall madly in love and we're infatuated with Him. We just can't get enough of Him. And, and, and I understand as, as we grow in the Lord, our relationship also matures and and it takes on a deeper meaning. And, and I understand that we may not have that honeymoon feel to our relationship with Him, but that doesn't mean that we treat it any less sacred. That doesn't mean that we're not madly, madly in love with Him. Don't allow the things of this world to steal your affections. The Bible says to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For Christ, who is our life, right? Paul said, you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Christ is our life. We should set our affections on that, but so many times the dogs and pigs of this world, they, I don't know how they do it, but they draw our attention away from how special and precious He is. Can I read you something just quickly? I, I'm reading from Tozer's book called Worship. To be honest, I could read the whole book to you. It'd be very fitting for this point. Let me just read a couple things. And I guess this is a poem day. Let me read you a poem that he puts in the book about this. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, dearest Lord, forgive me if I say, for very love thy sacred name a thousand times a day. Burn, burn, O love, within my heart. Burn fiercely night and day till all the dross of earthly loves is burned and burned away. It's so easy for the things of this earth to become entangled by it so that Jesus becomes literally an afterthought. Tozer went on to comment about adoring God and he said, I will say that when we adore God, all of the beautiful ingredients of worship are brought to white incandescent heat with the fire of the Holy Spirit. To adore God means we love Him with all the powers within us. We love Him with fear and wonder and yearning and awe. I don't know. I struggle to put words to the proper way to love God. I think He's come close to what I would like to, to communicate to you today. Tozer also points out in the book that there are some Christians that constantly beat themselves up because they never feel as if they love God enough. Never will you. Never will you. But he, he, gives, a, he gives an illustration about a young man who came to him asking about his spiritual life. And he said, you know, sometimes I feel that my heart is growing cold and sometimes I feel like I, I've, I've fallen out of that first love and Brother Tozer had this to say. He said, My brother, only the heart is hard that does not know it's hard. Only he is hardened who does not know he is hardened. When we are concerned for our coldness, it is because of the yearning God has put there. God has not rejected us. I give those words to you to comfort you that if you're concerned this morning, with your relationship with Christ and you would like to increase the intensity with which you love Him, then friend, that's a good indication that you are still growing, that you're still yearning after Him. Don't take lightly this sacred relationship, this fellowship that you have with the precious Savior. Can I ask you to turn just a couple pages back to Hebrews chapter 13? Hebrews 13 and verse 4. The next thing I'd like to say, give not up, number one, your sanctification. Give not the Scripture. Number three, give not your sacred fellowship, all that walk with God. Adore Him. 
And number four, give not, give not over to the dogs and swine. Don't treat it as something refuse, as something despised. Give not up your spouse. Number four, give not up your spouse. And I, I'm, oh, I'm going so much deeper than just saying don't divorce her. I'm going so much deeper than saying don't cheat on her or him. But for the sake of the point, let's read verse 4, Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. I found it interesting as I studied for this sermon, I came across this word in verse 4, honorable. The Greek word that gives us that is a word, timios, and that word, although very, it's very appropriate and correct to translate it honorable, and I believe it's the best word for this verse. That is the same word that gives us precious. It gives us uh, the word valuable. Same word, translated different ways in the Bible. That marriage that God has allowed you to have, that spouse should be treated something very special, valuable, precious, and with great honor. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 31, there in verse 10 and on down to the end of the chapter, it says a virtuous woman, her, her price is far above rubies. Very precious. Friend, please don't take your spouse for granted. You say, well, Brother Mike, I didn't, I didn't get a, 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 a ruby. I didn't get a precious gem. I think, I think God put a lump of coal in my stocking. Well, you know, that lump of coal, that might, if after enough time, and if you hang with it and stick with it after enough pressure, that you, you might just get a diamond out of it. Every relationship takes work. Whether it's that relationship with God, right, that I just spoke of, that sacred union and fellowship that you have with Him, it takes work to keep it fresh. It takes genuine effort to keep it real. The same is true with your spouse. Don't give up on your marriage. Work at it. Now, I believe it, it should go without saying. I'm going to say it anyway because in verse 4 it's pointed out, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Please don't throw away your marriage for some dog or some pig, for some, someone else wanting to jump in and, and interfere with the marriage. Oh, please don't give it up just for that, for that momentary lust and pleasure of the flesh. But more so than that, I'd like to please encourage you, don't give up the precious moments that you can have with your spouse. 24 years ago today, I married the most wonderful woman. And her and I were able to laugh and talk and enjoy each other's company. We can spend a lockdown together and love every minute of it. Husbands, Wives, please put effort into that marriage and, and make the most of every moment so that when you get to those twilight years of life and the sun begins to set on your days that you don't look back with regret, but you look back and, and think, oh, how many precious memories we've stored up. Last but not least, I want to take you to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 and verse number 36. Give not up your sanctification. Don't give up the Scriptures. Don't give up the sacred fellowship with God. Don't give up on your spouse. And lastly, don't, don't give up your soul. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Let me ask you, friend, today, What's your soul worth to you? What is a soul worth? Let's just ask it like that, even more general. What, what is it worth? God answered the question when He sent His only begotten Son. Not only did He, did he come down to this earth in human form, born of a virgin, lived as a man, He suffered as a man. Not, not only did, did He come down, but then He humbled Himself to the point of dying on the cross. He allowed these horrible sufferings and horrible atrocities to be done to Him to show you just how much your soul is worth. When God wanted to redeem the world, listen, He didn't give the world to redeem it. 
Because the world is worth more than that. The souls of the world, your soul is worth more than all the riches of the world. He had to send the most precious thing in the universe. He sent his son. One day you'll stand before God. And at the judgment, if this question was posed, friend, how would you answer this? If God were to ask you, why should I let you come into heaven? What would you tell him? What answer would you offer? What would you give for the redemption of your soul? The Bible says in the book of Psalms, the redemption of the soul is precious. You have something holy, something valuable that has been made available to you. The Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ purchased your redemption. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That precious gift of His cleansing blood is being offered to you. If you stand at the judgment and say, God, I was a deacon in a church. My friend, that's, that's great, but that's not valuable enough to redeem your soul. You say, I did the very best I could to be a good person. I lived right according to my standards. My friend, that's not enough. You say, but I got baptized, and I, I grew up in a Christian church, and I've gone to church every week of my life. Friend, that's not enough. There was only one thing that could pay for your sins, and that was the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you stand before God and He says, why should I let you into heaven? There's only one answer that will be acceptable, and that is, God, I put my trust in what your Son did for me on the cross of Calvary. I did not take that gift lightly. I esteemed Him precious, and I accepted Him as my Savior. Friend, if you're trusting anything else, you are, in effect, giving away your soul. Too many people, they spend their entire life searching for fame and fortune. They want everything the world has to offer, not only the physical things that they can hold in their hands and see with their eyes, but they want the esteem and the honor that comes from their colleagues and, the, and society in large. You can have everything the world has to offer and lose your own soul. Give not your soul for a few days of high esteem. If you have to today, maybe you need to humble yourself before God and say, God, I did the best I could. God, I was a deacon in a church. God, I was raised in a Christian home. Whatever you fill in the blank, God, that's what I was. But God, I know that it's not enough. I've sinned and I've come short. And I, I want to take... I want to take... Uh, genuinely today. I want, I want to take it for real today that, that Jesus died for me. I want to ask you to please come into my heart and save me. Friend, that's a decision that only you can make. Don't give away your soul just to hang on to your pride. Humble yourself before a holy and almighty God who loves you more than you could imagine, who believes your soul is so valuable that He gave His Son for it. Would you come to Him today? Don't give up another day. Go not another day without Christ in your heart. Can I leave you with this thought? In the Old Testament, we read about Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn and therefore had the birthright. One day after hunting, he came home very hungry. Jacob had prepared a pot of beans. The Bible talks about it. Lentils. And Esau was so hungry, he thought, man, if I don't get a, if I don't get a bite to eat, I'm going to die. And Jacob, ever the, the wheeler and dealer, he said, I tell you what, I'll sell you a bowl of beans for your birthright. And Esau, why did he do it? In the moment, thought, well, better to have a bowl of beans than die of hunger. What's the birthright doing for me? Can't eat a birthright. And he sold his birthright for a bowl of beans. He gave it all up for a bowl of beans. Friend, don't take that which is holy and that which is precious and valuable and cast it away to the temporary temptations of the dogs and swine of this world. Take seriously what God has made available in your life. If you would, let's bow our heads and let's have a word of prayer.
Father, we want to take seriously today these holy and sacred things that you've given us. God, all of them that I've mentioned today, Father, as I mentioned earlier, I believe that there's a little bit here, a little bit there, it's buckshot going everywhere. But I pray that you would take the necessary words that were said and, and plant them deep into the heart that needed to hear it. Maybe one person needed point one, maybe another point two. God, whichever point needs to land, let it land on that good ground. Let it bring forth fruit. And I pray especially for any lost soul. God, maybe they've been around religion their entire life, but have never trusted the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away their sins. Please, God, today draw them in. Open their eyes to their need for you as their Savior. Please, God, before this day is out, might their soul belong to you, purchased by the blood of Christ. Thank you for all you've done. Help us to stand fast for the truth. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.